Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, so, um, let's see. Is it? What do I do to advance this one? Okay. Go find the button here. Okay, so um, I, this is going to be a little repetitive, or, or, I mean, sort of to continue on a little bit repetitive, but some additional suggestions. And I will say, this workshop was really, I thought, a really good one. It had about twice this many people, or it was, a, it was pretty big. Lots of outsiders and insiders, and, and it was uh, very helpful. And when we say should and recommendations, there was no consensus about everything. I mean, you, you already have heard some um, things that are, are and, and so they're just suggestions. I think it was really good to have that to be able to, uh, to discuss it. Uh, so one of the things, uh, and, and this is partly, um, I, I think the original title of the workshop, or at least the way many of us came in thinking, what, what should NHGRI do next? You know, what, now that we've grown up, what, what, what's the next, um, next uh, type of stuff? So a lot of uh, identity discussions about what, what is the institute. So clearly it supported large scale projects and these, these have been extremely important for a lot of reasons. Obviously the standardization, I'm not talking about just ENCODE here, I'm talking about everything that the, that the, uh, that the uh, Institute has done from the beginning, including the Human Genome Project. Um, uh, we, what comes out of this are quality control metrics, all sorts of things having to do with the processes uh, that you use, economies of scale, the way you share data, really uh, relatively different here than it would be for a small grant or small projects. Uh, and, and it allows you to at least start thinking about integration more. Not the, this is not the only place that you see that, but it allows that. So the small to medium sized projects, of course, are, are, are critical as well. It's not either or, they really should go hand in hand. Obviously with smaller ones, you get much more detailed knowledge and, and focus and interest in a particular biological problems, which of course is, is what NIH is about in general. Um, <clears throat> it's often much more mechanistic, um, uh, well, and, and often that is the goal is mechanism, and often in these big projects you don't get at mechanism. Uh, there, we should have some discussion, I think Frank Pugh will, will probably bring this up, uh, about that being potentially something that we should think about integrating into larger scale projects too. And for testing specific hypotheses, obviously. And also, obviously, the smaller ones uh, support a large number of researchers. But I will say the big projects do too. I mean, ENCODE has a huge number of people in it. I don't know how many, uh, all told, and the Genome Project had even more. So, there, so I'm just going to go through some of the themes that were, the cross-cutting themes that were at um, the workshop, and then a little bit more about, um, I guess, recommendations in quotes. So um, clearly, genome, a big part of this is genome biology itself is important. We can't forget that. We haven't figured it all out. It needs to be something probably that the Institute uh, should uh, continue to lead in. Uh, evolutionary genomics is uh, really important. This has been extremely valuable, not just for this one point here about finding conserved elements but by comparing uh, our nearest uh, relatives. Uh, but for, for almost every step of the way, and obviously R01s, many other institutes uh, do, do this, use this, but it's been a pretty critical part of ENCODE and uh, some other, other parts of the, of the NHGRI. Um, and uh, I, I just want to emphasize that we have learned a lot about, from, from before the Genome Project even started, there were about 100 of Mendelian diseases that were understood. There are now four, four or 5,000, some very large number, and growing. Uh, and they really uh, teach us a lot about knockouts, or, because most of them, of course, are recessive loss of functions, mutations. Some of them are dominant mutations, and they're interesting. So uh, these are suggestions, not recommendations. That's the, that's the word that we're using. So again, just echoing what a couple have said, don't try to, NHGRI uh, probably shouldn't try to do everything in genomics, and clearly we're, it's not. I mean, they're all the institutes, or many of the institutes, are using genomic tools, especially in the genetics arena, but in others as well. So, uh, and this is actually not a suggestion to partner with other institutes, because it has been since the beginning, but probably need, that there's probably opportunity to do even more. And I, I will say that I do remember in 1990, that was a big deal to start trying to get the institutes um, uh, to interact more, and I think it's been pretty successful. Um, so many, 
uh, whole genome sequencing projects especially, and, and even functional genomics on large scale with really, really large numbers of samples, sometimes hundreds or thousands, uh, are being done by other institutes and will continue to be done. These are usually disease specific. That's not really a suggestion. This is sort of the background for it. But it, the suggestion is that um, NHGRI should still play a major role in those kinds of studies, but as you've heard, probably should not be the only, I mean, certainly are, are not expected to be the lead in those. So here is how, some of the ways that we thought that, uh, and these are from the workshop, they're from, uh, from our colleagues, and uh, partly just Mark and I uh, talking about this over the last few days. Um, so one of the key things is, I mean, it's wonderful that we can sequence DNA for whatever we can and don't believe $1,000, but whatever we can do a whole genome for, and maybe we can get better at even uh, at analyzing it too so that it's even less. But imagine that being another tenfold boost or another hundredfold boost, and that's, and, and the, probably the only way that that will happen is for NHGRI to continue to, to lead in this, or at least support the development of this. And I will say, while these have been companies, they've been, com they've been uh, academic company partnerships, I would say, and I've sat on lots of grants that Jeff Schloss and others led that, um, uh, for technology development, and a lot of the technology development, de development comes out of sometimes wacky ideas in academia that end up leading to companies and sometimes monopolies, unfortunately. Um, so, um, so we, this is actually something I wish uh, um, uh, Evan Eichler was here so he would see that I'm pandering to him, but we should support work to where we really don't give up on the hard parts of the genome. In fact, we almost did at the, in the Genome Project, and actually Evan was one of the ones, but others as well, how critical those regions are. And so we really want to be able to look at every base pair in the genome, uh, regardless of the context of it and try to figure, uh, figure this out. And I'll bet you in all these big projects uh, that many of us are involved in looking at undiagnosed diseases, et cetera, I bet you many of the ones that we're not seeing are ones that we're not sequencing well. Um, I could do several slides on just saying this. You've heard a lot about it. I will say one thing about phenotypes. When we talk about all these high throughput assays for function, especially for transcription function, which uh, Joe talk, showed one, there are many, there's quite a few others. Those are really valuable. They are ways of helping to link uh, at least molecular function to a SNP or to a DNA sequence variant, but that ain't the organism. And I think we have to, I mean, it's, that's an obvious point. So do you make a mouse? Do you do whatever? But going from, a, I work on psychiatric uh, disorders, which are the hardest and worst things to work on, and trying to link a, a, a promoter mutation that clearly affects transcription in a maybe a big, big way to whether that's causing the phenotype is, a, is, is probably one of the hardest things that we need to, to do. And I don't think there are easy answers to that, uh, as, as Joe uh, mentioned. Um, and uh, again, and I'm not pandering here because even though I'm not a bioinformatics, clearly the rate limiting on most of the things and many of the things that we do are not the experimental wet lab parts. They still need to be done well and, and they are still hard, they still need developments, but is, is, is figuring out how to uh, uh, handle the data. And that means every step of the way on that. And um, while this institute has, does support that in a, quite a big way, it almost never is enough, and, and, um, and, and we need to probably get a whole lot better at that. And so part of that is supporting the development of the new tools for that. But I, I will say this, just from my own experience, that development needs to be hand in hand with the biologists because it, it does not do any good to develop algorithms if, if nobody needs them. Uh, and then systems biology approach, we've already talked about, and others have talked about doing perturbations in a big way. Uh, and we, we, we all see that it's happening a lot more. Um, so, uh, so sort of the, uh, summarizing a couple of those is emphasizing integrating functional studies with evolutionary information. We don't do that very much, and it, it turns out to be very, very powerful. So that means not just measuring conservation, but looking at all of the parts of that and, and uh, the population genetics folks especially, but then going back and integrating that with kind of understanding how transcription mechanisms work. You have a variant, you think it's, you know something about its conservation, uh, uh, and then you need to understand, if we're talking about transcription, you need to understand transcri trans transcription. And we'd also like to get better and better at, pred at predicting whether a, mut a variant is deleterious or not, and so there are these various methods that have been developed there that are quite good. I think they can get better, too, or we think they can get better. Um, 
<clears throat> so, um, so, the, oh, so this is starting to get into the mechanics of how you might do it, and I think we're going to probably have discussions throughout this workshop. Uh, how do you want to do this? Um, uh, and again, I'm not being self-serving here because I want every one of these, so I guess I am self-serving. But, uh, but you want to, um, uh, you'd probably still need to do some production size or some large to medium size uh, projects uh, like ENCODE so that you get the advantages of those. But you need lots uh, of smaller grants and, and especially to create the technology but to apply it as well maybe partnering more, and I think this is ju just a general point about NIH, but certainly here as well, that, that those should continue to be a, and probably an increased part of their portfolio. Uh, and that means things like, like these couple here, but many others as well. Uh, all right, so here's some of the more, uh, less experimental, but more. So the idea that there's all these efforts that are going on and they're not coordinated in any way. And there, there are different institutes, there are different countries. Some of, I shouldn't say they're not coordinated at all. Um, uh, Dan and uh, you guys talked a little bit about, Mike and Dan talked about all of those projects. And clearly there's some interactions between them. But you can't go to one place and get this region of the genome in all the different places that in all the different projects, here's what we've learned from it. I don't know how that might be so hard uh, to do, but this whole, whole idea of interoperability and then a, a cataloging them, integrating them, and somehow do that. The, uh, the idea of, of the experimental and data analysis standards, having some set of standards, that's the only way you'll be able to integrate or make them interoperable. Uh, and um, this isn't just whole genome sequencing, of course. This is all the stuff that we've been talking about with functional genomics, et cetera, uh, and metabolomics even, uh, epi epigenetics. And then I just, one more pitch, which I hope we, I think we all should s say something about this. One of the very powerful things about NHGRI, some of the other institutes, I guess, are, I, I know do this as well, but NHGRI from the beginning has uh, taken a, a big, big uh, effort in training genome scientists, because we didn't have genome scientists when the project started. And there have been lots of, some of those are great success stories in this, uh, young folk, younger folks uh, in this room and, and, and still up and coming. Here's one reason, uh, Mark uh, and his team got this together, and actually these numbers are, might even be underestimates, I, I don't know, he was worried about TCGA being so big. But there, this is just RNA-seq. And they're just giant numbers of data sets on those. I would love to be, and frankly, we do use TCGA ourselves. We go and look at it and, use, and then apply that back into ENCODE. It'd be nice if that was easier to do. I think that's probably the most important thing. And that's just one, one type of data. There are others as well. GTEx doesn't have a, have a logo. I couldn't find it anyway. But maybe they do. Um, and so here's one uh, example and uh, is that uh, people have talked about the DCC that Mike Cherry is running for ENCODE and the uh, data um, DAC also, which is a data analysis center. And it's, a, it's a basically groups in ENCODE, a lot of people in ENCODE who get together and put all the data together in a high, high uh, dimensional, high quality way standardized and in, in a coordinated way. And that's one reason why I think ENCODE data is valuable, because we've been able to, to do that. And if it was just, if it wasn't um, standardized and, and we weren't doing things similarly, it would be much harder to do that. Um, <clears throat> and it would be nice to be able to do that worldwide and, uh, um, you know, connect that to sequence variants. I mean, that's what Joe kept mentioning that Mark and I would talk about that. That was a big part of the meeting as well as what we all think we should be doing, of course. Uh, and then I have standardized pipelines for everything uh, that we do on that. Uh, Mark liked this. Uh, who, I can't remember who pr proposed the, uh, the Amazon model. Was it John? John, I think this was you, John. We'll blame this on John Stam, that, uh, that the idea that Amazon started out being really, really good at one thing and then expanded into uh, 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 everything. Uh, so, all right, so uh, th this is, uh, Mark, you wanna come up for? questions. This is, uh, that's what we had to say. I think um, uh, key messages were, were here and uh, hopefully will lead to discussion. Y Ewan? The, the, the last part, um, I think it's really good and really positive the way, uh, as in particular the ENCODE 3 DCC has developed and evolved. But I think it's inevitable that all of biology interlinks. 
and there's a point where you just want to traverse all data sets, you know, from structural biology through to through to ENCODE, through to something else, through to cell models, through to image data sets, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's a big role that, you know, NCBI and EBI play. And I, the good thing about the current model is that the way Mike does it is very much in line with these bigger aggregation points. But I think ENCODE's got to see itself in the context of all these other data sets. It's not the case that because of that interconnectedness, you know, you should try and organize everything because, yeah. because it's a, it, that, that problem is just impossible. Nor do we think that way at the EBI. It's, it's really genuinely impossible. What you have to do is enable all these different communities to correctly link up um, across this uh, information space. His, his uh, you know, he's run the Saccharomyces Genome Database since Absolutely. the yeah. 80s or 90s, whenever it started. Uh, uh, and, it, and it was, is, sorry, it's still, he still runs it, I think. It, uh, it is that. They have whole teams of, of not just curators, but people who try to do that for lots of different types of data, including, I think, uh, cell biology and imaging data. But this, I, I'm not sure if that's easier. It's a smaller community. It's a, I, I, it's a I mean, I think organism. it's a smaller community and more organized data, right? I just don't think, I, I would caution from trying to, trying, to, trying to have the ambition to be all of that connected. I, I, I just think that it's just going to collapse on itself. You will, it, it won't work. I mean, that's, it's very clear it won't work in my head because that's kind of all of human biology and there's no way you can, you can handle that. Well, the, the well, one, point. one word I've used, you probably have with the concept of data broker and so yeah. forth. And I, I, I kind of think that, you know, one question is how does EBI and NCBI see us? And obviously you're the person to answer that question. Um, but, you know, in the sense that you probably don't want all these projects and all the individual investigators directly putting stuff, you know, into the sort of central repository. You, you probably want something like a genomic data broker that's kind of, you know, handling a lot, kind of putting together something. And I mean, what, what would be, I mean, in terms of making the ultimate knowledge base for biology or for science in the future, what, what is the right model, actually? I mean, so, so we absolutely, we, we use the word broker. This is quite annoying. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> Um, we use the word broker, um, and, and a number of resources act as a broker. We have community-driven resources that act as a broker, sometimes model organism databases like Flybase, like, like yeast, sometimes portals like ENCODE or, or organizers in ENCODE. Other people completely back their whole limb system onto us. Uh, so Sanger does that, TGAC does that, everything else. So we have a variety of different modalities about how that can be supported. So I do think the broker model is the right model, but that model suggests that a community has to say, this is the data sets and the data items that we really organize. You know, this is the stuff that we, as a community, do, and this is the stuff that, therefore, that we don't do, and this is the stuff that we want to broker back into the system uh, so that everybody else can use it. And, and drawing those boundaries correctly is the, is the art of the game. And I think that it's quite easy, because everything in biology is interconnected, to suddenly not see any boundary. And then, and then it just kind of becomes a sort of, uh, it becomes an impossible task to, to handle that. And I think you need to have the right boundary of, the, of, this, uh, of that ambition. So, uh, yeah, I think, I think one, one thing is, you know, to start, I think it's possible, but it's very hard, as Ewan said. But the first thing is to take similar data and get it in one place and interoperable. So you can just take the ENCODE-like data and get it somewhere in the world in one place, right? In the next decade, that would be a good thing. I mean, I still, well, I think your uh, mission one is to make sure that you continue to organize your own data and broker it back into the system and make, it, make that accessible. If you fail at that mission, then, then, uh, then everything else is not is not good. So, you and then or all of you. That means then a user. I mean, we should be doing this for the users out there. That's the whole, uh, the, the biggest point. The user might want might be studying um, either a transcription factor or so a cell type or something, and not know about all those other ones. That though. So that's that's the problem. So how I, I thought yeah. that's what we were. Yeah. yeah. So 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 they, those are the roles of the of 
of making sure all the data is registered and then people building other user-focused portals on top of those registries and schemes. And some of that, from a genomic sequence perspective, you call a genome browser. But from, you, you know, you think of genome browser not as a genome browser, but as a registry of interested yeah. experiments that you can hook onto the genome. And, and so you shouldn't have one, you should have a big variety depending on the user group. Um, and there should be a separation between the, the data flow coming in and the, and the portal that, that integrates data around it. And, and any other model I don't think scales well. So I think, I think if you try and confound the portal and the brokering, you get yourself into a huge amount of mess. Well, pra practically though, do you, do you think that, I mean, for the future genome browser, is that something for instance, for a future genome browser that takes in more than just ENCODE data, it browses all of the genomic stuff or something like that. Is that something that EBI does, or is that something uh, that, is that a portal onto data in EBI, or how yeah, does that work? So, so that's, the, there are portals where EBI, so it's not just one portal, don't forget. It, portals are really focused on user groups. So you might have a portal that's focused on people who want to start from structural biology and then go from there, or a portal is really stepping stones from user groups. So there isn't, there shouldn't be one data broker, there shouldn't be one portal. All of these different ecosystem part, components of the ecosystem have to have to work together. And you know, UCSC Ensemble would, you know, they have forward plans, they want to keep serving their communities well. You know, if they were they they would they would have ambitions for lots of these different things. That shouldn't prevent anybody else standing up and saying, I want to produce a portal around this, around some data sets as well. Um, but you've got to be in a multi-portal, multi-data broker world. I'm just wondering whether I can sort of ask a different sort of kind of question. Um, you raise obviously the issue of sequencing technology, um, and one part of sequence technology classically has been more sequence, better, more accurate, faster, cheaper. Um, but obviously it would be tremendously helpful because we are talking of cis elements for the most part to have long-range, you know, Contiguity. So, where does where meaning where is that, and where does this fit in? Would it make some epigenomic analyses easier? I would. I could think of There's scenarios where range. that's yeah. that's right. And and where does this? Uh, where is the technology, and how does it affect? In this? Um, so obviously, people are still working on this for that reason, and it is important. When you do have it, it certainly helps with um, de novo genomes. There's still a lot of there's still a few groups, not a lot, sequencing a lot of hard genomes, but it's really paid off in RNA. I think more than anything because of getting the contiguity. Your point about really long range contiguity of putting in phase this element with this one in the, in the DNA would be a really good one. There are, uh, I mean, we. I, there are probably people in the room who know more about this than, than I do, but we, we use and are trying to stay on top of all of the different technologies, and they're real error prone. They're not high throughput. They're expensive, but they could get a whole lot better, and I think that's, that's still the hope. Is that what you were asking, or you were, okay. Specifically, are there current error rates such? I can see that assembling a, you know, getting a new genome would be terrible. Even resequencing, you know, genomes might be bad, but is their sequencing so, so bad that for many kinds of epigenetic analysis it would be terrible? Yes. Yes. At least in our hands. I don't know. Jeff or somebody, I don't know, maybe you guys know more. I mean, it, and, it, and, and it's actually not just the error rate, it's that the throughput is, you know, a ten thousandth of the other technology, so it's really expensive. We done? Thank you. <laughs>